Welcome back to Music 239, Intro to World Music. And today we have a guest lecture from Dr. Margaret Buckner, who is a professor in the MSU Department of Sociology and Anthropology. And we're delighted to have her with us. Dr. Buckner has done extensive research in the areas of uh, African culture, and particularly in African music. Uh, as you listen to her segment and see her fascinating examples, I think you'll understand one of the things I say about the fact that Africans are very frugal and tend to make musical instruments all out of whatever happens to be lying around. And you'll see that uh, very clearly with her presentation. Please welcome Dr. Buckner. I can introduce myself, okay. I guess. Yeah, we've never met either. I'm Margaret Buckner, by the way. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, and I have come a few times to give this talk, and I must confess I am not a professional musician, and I have not read your textbook, okay? So I do not know what you're going to be tested on, and I don't know what they teach about African music. My experience from African music comes from being there and from also working with a professor, um, my professor, who worked there um, starting in the 1950s and who wrote a book on African harps and on, on other sorts of things of African music. So this is a combination of all of that. And the main point that I'm going to want to just kind of let you notice is how varied the music is just in one group and, um, and how, ex how extremely complex it can be. Because I know some places I've heard African music is simple. Um, and I don't know why, what the characteristics are that are called simple, but I hope you'll learn from this that it's not simple in a whole lot of ways. The first slide I put up is just so that you can realize how thoroughly diverse Africa is. Each one of those little words is a separate language, and that means a separate culture, and that means a separate tradition and a separate music style and all those kinds of things. So already lumping you know, all of Africa or any part of the world together is it, it's kind of overgeneralizing. Um, now you won't be able to see, but Zande is right smack in the middle, right underneath the oranges, okay? And that's the, the one that I'll be talking about today. Ta-da! Um, it's in the Central African Republic, um, is the middle pink one, and there's some Zande in the Sudan, way south of Darfur, and then they're in the Northern Congo. I was in the Peace Corps in the Central African Republic, before you were born, okay, in 19, early 1980s. And um, I went there to teach English and Spanish in the high schools, um, but I had already had my degree in anthropology before I went, and when I got there, I met the, my professor. He happened to be there, and then from then on, I just went on and studied the Zande. So it was just fate um, that, that we happened to meet each other. You know, a, a, a girl from California and a French professor from Paris, and we meet in the jungles of Central Africa. It was a very nice situation. Um, so this is the Zande, and this is um, a few slides about how they live. Um, a little bit about, um, that's the scenery. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's on the border between the tropical rainforest and the savannas. Um, it is very hot, and it rains a lot. There are a lot of trees. That's the main road. And I'm showing that picture because this is the only road for the entire eastern part of the Central African Republic. So how much traffic do you think they get out there? Not much at all. And there are still some very, very, very traditional peoples out there who do not have radios, who do not have tape recorders and stereos, and who continue to make their own music. And they make their own dance music and their own songs and their own entertainment. And it's a wonderful place to be. Um, that's just another picture of the scenery, um, just to kind of give you an idea. That is a, a typical house. Wouldn't you like to live in that? I think it's gorgeous. Um, thatched roofs are nice in the rain. They don't make loud noises when mangoes fall on them and stuff. Um, they are made of, of um, clay bricks and um, just households like that. You'll have a man and his wives, and then not farther, pardon me, a man and his wife, and then households will be scattered um, in, the, in the bush. Um, they grow food for a living. They grow fields like this. They clear the forest. Then they'll plant manioc um, and peanuts and sweet potatoes and other kinds of foods. When I was there in 1995, I didn't eat any foods that didn't come from within a 10-mile radius. Okay? And it was absolutely wonderful. Everything was fresh, and I don't think I ever ate better in my whole life. I did take my coffee with me, though, because I needed that, okay? coffee and sugar. Um, water comes from springs. And you can see how absolutely crystal clear that water is. Um, just like the Ozarks, there are springs every once in a while, and there's absolutely no problem with water. So people living in the villages, even today, um, are self-sufficient. Um, that was 
until the ten, last 10 years because now all sorts of bad things are happening there. Pretty self-sufficient food-wise, and as I said, very self-sufficient entertainment-wise. These are just a picture of some of the kids in the village. Very happy place to grow up. Children are loved, and uh, there's lots of playing and laughing. Um, I don't know if anyone's told you yet that they've done studies, and in the world, Africans do the most laughing. Okay? So of all the peoples in the world, they laugh the most. And I think the goal in life is to laugh. And that's been true of everywhere I've been in Africa. Do you know Africans? Any of you? Oh, what a shame. Well, if you did, you'd be laughing with them all the time, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to start with some vocal music, um, because vocal music is something that people learn as they grow. There is no, um, they don't go to school to learn it. They don't have to learn how to do the do, re, mi, fa, so. They don't memorize parts. They don't say, okay, I'll do the soprano, and I'll do the alto, and here's the words we're going to sing. It's all improvised. There are tunes that people kind of learn, but every time they sing them, they sing them slightly differently. They change the words, um, and they, they'll throw in different harmonies. And these four girls, I came upon one day, and they were just singing these songs together. And so I got out my tape recorder and recorded them. This was in 1988, if I remember correctly. I'm going to try and get the, and I call them the, go -go, the Agogo girls because the stream next to the hunting camp where they were camped here was called the Agogo. So let's see if this works. This song says, you stole my boyfriend. Kumba mi bero. My boyfriend is in your hands. If you feel like joining in with some of the harmonies, go right ahead. And I hope that gives you an idea of the kind of the way they just weave their voices in and out. And they truly do improvise. I've heard them make up new verses about things that have happened. And they'll call each other by names and make fun of each other. And then just throw in new kind of um, harmonies and stuff. And again, none of this is like learned in school or even practiced ahead of time. It's just something that you grow up doing. Okay? Um, the next one are older women singing. And it's kind of the same idea that you have a group of women and they're going to make music. This happens, this is not the picture of the ceremony where this is happening. This is a picture of the women. But the singing comes from about a year later and it was a ceremony to celebrate the end of a year of mourning. Okay? So they're singing about the dead person, but he has been dead for, ten, for a year already, and now they're able to take up their normal lives and not do all of the mourning, tradition, mourning rituals anymore. So this is a group of older women, and uh, they're not at all sad, as you'll be able to tell. Okay. 
Um, now, there's one more piece that are done by girls, and then after this, we're going to switch to the guys. And these are younger girls. Um, they're between the ages of about 10 and 15. They're the ones that do this the best. And what they do is stand in water and play the water as though it was a drum. Okay? And I call it water drumming. They call it kata bokpu. Um, and it's something that girls learn how to do, and they get very, very go good at. And then after they grow older, then they kind of forget how to do it. It's kind of like I'm sure some of you girls learned how to do those really fancy clapping games. Okay? And then once you grow out of it, or jump roping, there are some fantastic girl jump ropers okay, in this world. But as soon as they grow up and get married and have kids, you know, they don't do that girl stuff anymore. That's kind of what this is. I'm going to let you listen to two that are a group, all four of them. And these are the very four girls that you're going to hear. It's like an orchestra. One of them will be going splash, 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 fast. The other kerplunk, kerplunk. The other one will be doing little bits almost like a piano. Okay? So that's the first two. reactions? Have you ever heard anything like that before? Did you even know you could make water sound like that? Okay. I really think that that girl, her name is Paulette. You heard Paulette. You heard someone calling her. She should be like in Carnegie Hall and be getting awards for that ability. Uh, but there are you know, hundreds of girls that can probably do it just as well. Um, now, I hadn't discovered that. I had lived in Zandeland for years, and I never knew they even did that. Okay. And missionaries who had been there and actually who had been born there and grown up there, so they were second generation missionaries living in Zemio near here, had no clue that the Zande even did this. Because the, the women do this when they go down to the streams at around two o'clock in the afternoon when it's really hot and everybody's sweaty and dirty and you go down there with the little babies and you give everybody a bath and you wash all the clothes and you hang out down there where it's really cool and that's where you know, the girls start doing this. And of course, no missionaries are gonna go down to where the women are bathing at two o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? In their right minds, they wouldn't be down there. So um, you have to be in the right place. I noticed it one day, I was walking home, I was late and I heard it. Okay? And I went over to find out what's this and then and I found out they have this tradition of doing this. Um, a few other places in the world they do this. I know that the Baca pygmies and a few other pygmy groups do it. I've heard of it in, South, in the South Pacific and some of the islands in the South Pacific, but I've never heard any of them to this, um, I want to say, virtuosity. I mean, that, the, the, it's like playing the piano, yeah, just incredible. So that is um, definitely something that Zande girls do. Um, I'm going to switch over to the boys now. They're not far behind. They're just as inventive. And um, what they do is they make their own in musical instruments. And these are just pieces of bamboo. And again, I'd never heard of this. I was walking by and I saw it. Okay? I took a picture of it and I happened to have a tape recorder, so I tape recorded it. And I never saw it since and I'd never seen it beforehand and I've never heard of anybody describe it. Um, but these are pieces of bamboo. And inside the big piece of bamboo is a littler pipe. Okay? And what they do is they do it like a trombone. Okay? So I guess this would be a native trombone. I don't know who invented trombones, or at least Western trombones, but um, the Zande make their own trombones, or at least these boys did. And it's exhausting, but here's kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> 
roosters there too, obviously. Um, so the ingenuity of these kids, now I don't know if someone taught them how to do it or it's just something that boys do all the time, but can you imagine kids in our society going out and making their own instrument like that? Do we have any examples of that? We used to make cigar box guitars out of rubber bands. <laughs> we don't even have cigar boxes anymore though, so I guess that wouldn't work. Okay, next one are the drums. And I'm sure you've all heard about you know, the African talking drums and all that. Well, there are two kinds of drums that the Zande have. One of them is the, um, the slit drum, and that's the diagram up on top, as well as the one that he's sitting on. Um, and that's made of wood. And they're usually made, um, or one of the main purposes of them is to communicate. They do send messages. Um, they're also used nowadays also for some, like at parties and, and dancing and stuff. But the main purpose, a lot of people think was for sending messages, and that's why people call them the talking drums. There's also the smaller leather drum, and that's typically used only for parties and only for, mus for you know, to accompany other musical instruments. It's a goo-goo. Um, and uh, there are two sticks, as you can see, and he's got the two sticks, and one lip is usually a higher tone than the other lip, okay? So you've got those two tones, plus different parts of the wood, if they're thinner or farther down, they'll have different tones. So there's two main tones, a high and a low, and then there's also other tones depending on the drum and depending on the language and depending on the drummer, okay, they're gonna get other tones out of it. Now, the Zande language has three tones, okay? In other words, if I say, mi andugba, that means I'm going tomorrow, and mi andugba, that means I left yesterday, okay? The syllables are the same, but the tones are different, and all of Zande is like that. And so the theory is that you use the drums to imitate the tones, and then you can kind of guess what the message is. Well, um, I'll let you listen to it first. The, the, uh, the piece that you're gonna hear is not really a message, okay? But you'll just be able to hear the, um, the tone of it. It's to call people to mass, okay? It's, what, it's in front of the Catholic Church and they use it. They don't have a bell loud enough, so they use the drums to call people to mass because people don't usually have clocks and watches and stuff. So this will be number 11, and it is a goo goo. Time to go to mass. We could have that on campus for time for class to start. Um, you can hear that thing for miles. And the way they used to send messages is um, one village, if something happened, there was a death or something terrible happened, an epidemic or you know the white people are coming or whatever, you can send a message, one village, the next village down will hear it because you can hear that thing for miles. They'll repeat it. The next village down will hear it. They'll repeat it. The next village down will hear it and they'll repeat it. So it's like a telegraph. And did y'all see Lord of the Rings? You know, when they light the fire, then the next one down lit their fire, and the next one down lit their fire. It's the same kind of thing, just to get the message sent. I was walking with the girl once on our way into a village. Well, we were still about a mile away. We heard the drums. We were on our way back towards the village, and she heard it, and she said, a woman is lost. They don't know where she is. And she named the woman. It was an older woman, um, and she hasn't come back from her fields. She's lost, and no one knows where she is. We walked closer towards the village. She heard another message, and she said, they found her, and she's dead. Okay, this is all from listening to the drums. We got to the village. That's exactly what had happened. Okay, that very woman had been found dead in her field. She'd had a heart attack or something. She was elderly, but, um, but I, was, I was just impressed that she had heard all this from, from that drum. Okay, 
that'd be a great thesis if somebody wants to go study that. I don't think anybody has really truly studied that as deeply as it could be to figure out exactly how the language matches the drum tones. But that would be something you could try. By the way, if there are ever any questions, just um, questions are nice. OK. Um, this is actually an instrument that you find all over Africa. Um, it is sometimes called a thumb piano. Have you heard of being called that? It's actually an idiophone, but um, it's got little metal things. And of course, I have my very own. Can you guess where I bought this one by looking at it? <coughs> where do you go for tourist stuff here in southwest Missouri? Branson, and in particular? Silver Dollar City. Yeah, I got this at Silver Dollar City. <laughs> it had eight keys, and it said, and it had do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. I took out a couple, and I tuned it more or less to the pentatonic scale. I tuned it pretty good. It doesn't sound American, does it? <laughs> it certainly doesn't sound like Silver Dollar City. You want to play it? Sure, give it a try. Beautiful. It's hard to make. It's hard to make the pentatonic scale sound bad. Have you? T have you all know what pentatonic scale is? Okay, five strings. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a second. But this is the thing. Anybody else want to try it? Okay. I have another one, but somebody gave it to me that they found it in a garage sale, and it's just really, really awful. Um, but this thing has actually. I never counted the keys. How many keys are there on there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Maybe 13, maybe 14 <laughs> keys, if they don't lose any. And that's exact. They play it just like that, the thumb piano, and they play it and sing at the same time. Um, and I do have one excerpt of that, so that you can hear the the way it sounds when a real live Zande person plays it, and he'll also sing. <laughs> a solitary instrument. You don't really get into groups or have parties with it, but it's, it's nice for people to just, like you ha some people like to sit around and strum a guitar and sing. That's kind of what this is used for. Um, and now we come to another instrument that's hardly around anymore. Um, it's a balaphone, uh, simil very similar to a xylophone, but it's got gourds as resonance boxes that are hanging underneath. And by the way, people in Zandeland do not dress like that anymore, OK? They were dressing up for kind of a festival. Like we have you know, um, old-fashioned festivals where people dress up like their ancestors. That's what they were doing that day. They don't usually run around in skins and stuff like that anymore. Um, but it's, it's a really beautiful instrument, and it was an instrument used in courts, OK? The king's um, minstrels would play it. And it's also based on the pentatonic scale. And I have actually um, one of the king's sons uh, a prince or a, grand, a grandson of the king, actually, who's going to be singing a song with this one. A balaphone. 13. <laughs> Thank you. 
Does that sound like wood to you? No? Yes? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for playing. Okay. To me, it sounds like metal, kind of. Can you imagine somebody marching around the football field playing one of those? Why not? It would be just like the xylophones. Okay. The next one is indeed a xylophone. And um, this, is, this is a xylophone rather than a balophone because this does not have the resonance boxes. Okay? The keys themselves are what sound, and then the, the banana plant trunks serve to, as, as the base of the instrument. It's portable because each key, there's usually about 12, sometimes 14 keys, and they're made out of a special kind of wood, and you can see by their sizes okay, that they're going to have different, um, different tones. And you can collect those and carry them in a bag. Then you carry them to wherever the party is, because this is a party instrument. Um, you take them to wherever the party is. You cut down two banana tree plants, and then you make your xylophone. And then the party will last two or three or four days. And then you can take it you know, to the next place wherever there's going to be a party and cut down two more plants. So it is a portable xylophone. Okay? And um, this is the, the guy that's playing it. And this is exactly this guy that I recorded. Okay? This is a single player playing this xylophone. Uh, by the way, it is um, also pentatonic. It's got two octaves of five and then an extra two keys. This instrument is used like in parties. It's to make popular music, and people kind of sing the songs all together, and they dance as they go. And they have parties like the, at the end of a period of mourning, like you heard the, the song for earlier. They'll have a dance that'll last two or three or four days, and they stay up all night dancing. It's not a fun time to go. If you ever go to Zandiland, take, take earplugs with you, because you'll definitely need them. Um, this is the atmosphere for a dance. And um, like I said, there can be dozens and dozens of people circling the xylophone, which is kind of like the center of the dance. And then they'll have a drum or two. I think there's a drummer back there. And um, people will be kind of singing. There are rattles. They have um, rattles on their legs so that as they, as they move, um, they, uh, they make noise too. And everybody's drunk, of course, because this has been going on for two or three days. And there's a lot of manioc beer and corn beer. So people have a good time at these parties. OK, this is a. Uh, a party xylophone, if you will. to fraternity parties, maybe. See how that goes over. I bet it would go over really well, because you just kind of join right in, and there you go. <laughs> 